Welcome back, I'm Lucas and this is Roll to Hit Gaming's first look at the single player adventure mode of Freshwater Fly titled Fly Solo. Freshwater Fly was designed by Brian Suri and published by Bellwether Games who are sponsoring this video in which I'll show you how to set up and play this single player campaign mode. If you'd like more information on the multiplayer version of Freshwater Fly, you can check out the Roll to Hit Gaming Kickstarter preview that was posted during the crowdfunding campaign for this game. Let's get started so that you can get your game going and move down to the RTH game table for some solo fly fishing. Before we learn how to set up the game, let's first cover your adventure journal, which will be used to set up each game and track your progress and achievements. This journal is found in the back of your rulebook, but I'll put up a graphic so that we can walk through each section and we'll bring it back for reference as we walk through this video. Across the top of your map are the four unique locations at which you'll compete as well as the specific setup and silent angler scoring variations for each location. The lower left section allows you to track your scores against the silent angler each day, as well as track the advancements you've unlocked by completing challenges which award badges. You'll start with one badge, which is described here in your journal, which can be used to unlock a single momentum tile, which will be available for use in this and each subsequent game. We'll go ahead and mark A1 as our rulebook suggests. When completing further challenges, which we'll talk about momentarily, you can earn more badges to unlock additional starting finesse points, rocks to add to each rock pile, increasing the quantity and variety of special abilities you can gain through play, as well as different rods or player boards, bonus fish, or points. Each of these is described further in the appendix section of your rulebook, and I'll leave that for you to go through at your leisure. The final section of your guidebook on the lower right is your challenge section. Through gameplay, you'll catch fish or collect bonus hatch tokens or even land specific fish cards worth big points, which will unlock badges as we spoke about earlier. We'll cover this more when we start talking about scoring, but in the simplest possible terms, once you complete a challenge, you simply underline that badge and spend it in your journal to unlock and improve your fishermen. Now that you have a basic understanding of your guidebook, let's learn how to set up your game. We'll begin setup by placing our board in the center of the table, making sure to use the side that does not have the printed rock sections. Next, find your rock deck and shuffle it. Reference your journal to determine how many rock cards are going to be in each deck. We're obviously starting off a new adventure, so we only have one rock per deck, as indicated by our adventure journal. Then we'll reference the map to determine how to set those rock cards up based on the location at which we're playing. You start off at the Crooked Fork, so we'll place our rock cards at each of these three locations. Next, we'll find our deck of fish cards, ensuring that the point symbol is down, and we'll deal one fish card to each remaining space. Then place the unused fish cards in their indicated space on the game board. We'll again reference our adventure journal to set up our hatch tiles. And for the Crooked Fork, we're going to set up the four hatch tiles, as indicated in the lower right corner of the tile, along each of the spaces on the game board, and set up our five just off the game board. Next, We'll gather five each of each colored hatch token and place them in our included bag. Next, we'll again reference our journal and place the hatch tokens on each tile as indicated. At the first three locations of the adventure map, you'll end up with one leftover hatch token in your bag. Simply place this on the bonus hatch token space of the game board. When we talked about our adventure journal, we used the rulebook's example and selected Momentum Tile 1A as our starting unlock. So we'll place that tile right in the Momentum Tile section of the board. We'll place the Silent Angler token on the starting section of his track. Then we'll place our colored fly tokens near the board and put our casting marker nearby. That completes setup for the main board. Let's move down and take a look at your starting player setup. Again, we'll reference our adventure journal. It teaches us a lot about how we're going to set up our game for each play. For example, from the beginning, it indicates that we would use board 1A until we've unlocked further boards that can be used in future games. 
Also, until we complete some achievements and gain some badges and spend them on finesse, we're going to begin each game with zero finesse. Next, we'll take our drag token and place it on the indicated space of our player board, and then we'll select which color fly we're going to begin the game with. You'll want to reference the hatch tokens that you see out on the board by now to make this determination, but we'll cover that a little bit more in just a moment. For now, I'm going to pick a green fly, and we'll talk about why in just a second. And that's it. Setup is now complete, and we're ready to begin playing. Fly Solo is played across four unique locations over the course of seven days. Your goal is to defeat the Silent Angler at each location before the seven-day period ends. To claim victory, you'll have to execute the most efficient possible strategy by selecting dice from the pool and taking actions until either you or the Silent Angler has pulled in a seventh fish, triggering the end of the game. Each turn, you'll get to take the first three actions of the turn, and then the Silent Angler will use any remaining dice. Let's move back down to the table and learn about each of your available actions. While we're focused in on our player board, let's start talking about the actions that we can take on our turn. Those actions are Cast, Reel, and Finesse. Let's start with Finesse. As I said earlier, on your turn you're going to select a die and then carry out one of these three die actions. When you take a Finesse action, simply choose any dice from the available pool and move your marker up by two spaces, no matter what the die result was. On your turn, you can spend finesse points, usually to enable a bonus action, which will allow you to massage your gameplay and put you into a more favorable situation to increase your chances of success. Taking one of these special actions would qualify as a bonus action. Remember, on our turn, we're going to select a die and carry out one of the three dice actions, but we get to do any number of bonus actions that we have available. Let's assume for a moment that we had two finesse, and we'll walk through exactly how these finesse bonus actions work. First, if you have at least one finesse, as indicated by the yellow section of your player board, you can spend one finesse in order to change a die, either up or down one, to move a hatch token, either left or right on a game board, or, once you've gained your strike card, you can spend a finesse to gain one more if you didn't get the result you were looking for. Additionally, as long as you have at least two finesse putting you in this orange area of your board, you can spend one to swap out your fly to any other colored fly as long as you don't have a fish on the line. And then finally, if you have at least four finesse, still spending only one as indicated here in the corner of your finesse area, then you can place your drag token onto a fish that you've got on the line. We'll talk about why this drag token matters when we talk about catching fish. Again, the most important thing to remember when executing finesse bonus actions is that you require a certain number of finesse in order to use certain actions, but you spend only one no matter which action you're taking. Let's go back up to the game board and take a look at our cast action. To execute the cast action, as well as any of our die actions, the first step is to select a die out of the available pool. So let's assume that we'd selected this 5 for the purposes of our example here. The number on the die for the cast and real actions do matter, and in the cast actions case, it's going to indicate which column of the game board we're going to cast our line into. So in this case, column 5. We'll take our marker, and for our first landing, we'll select one of the fish in column 5 and place our casting marker there. So we'll just select this brook here. Next, you'll want to reference the hatch tokens that are in the river stream tile below that column. If it has a matching hatch token with the color of your fly, you'll gain a strike card. So we'll shuffle up our strike cards and deal one out. This card indicates that we failed to catch the fish, which means that we're going to drift down the stream. When you drift, you move your casting marker and place it on a fish adjacent to the fish you drifted from. So we'll just select this coho here. When you drift, you again reference the hatch tiles in your column and see if you've got a match with your fly token. We've still got a green match. So on a drift, that's going to give us an extra strike card. So in this case, we'll gain two strike cards rather than one. The first one's a miss, and the second indicates that we've caught this fish. We'll start by clearing our casting token out of the way, and then we'll take the fish we caught, flip it, and place it in the appropriately colored section above our player board. Black in the middle, green on the left, and yellow on the right. Our fish card is going to tell us a couple things. First up, it's going to tell us the drag value of the fish. We'll talk about how that works when we get into the real action, and it's also going to tell us 
how many victory points we'll gain by successfully catching this fish. Now, if we hadn't caught a fish with our second cast, we'd drift another space down the river. And if you drift onto a rock, you don't gain any strike cards. But if after your second drift you still haven't caught a fish, then your turn is over and you were unsuccessful. Now, because we caught a fish that was adjacent to a rock card, we get to claim this rock card and put it in our play area, and it's going to give us either scoring advantages or special abilities as gameplay progresses. We'll cover some of the different rock cards in just a bit, but for example, this card will allow us to score a bonus victory point for every rainbow or cutthroat that we catch in this game. Next, you'll take a hatch token from the column you caught the fish from that matches the color of your fly and place it in your real board in the center position here. We'll refill the empty spaces on our board, and we don't refill with rock cards, so fish will just occupy that now empty rock card space. And as a side note, we used our strike cards for the purposes of this example. However, there is an app in your favorite app store that will allow you to simply touch the screen of your favorite device and deal a new strike card. So next up, we'll cover the final dice action available to us, which is the real action. And for that, let's zoom a little closer into our player board. And this is what our player area looks like after having caught a fish. Next, we'll want to reel it in so that we can score those victory points as we work towards defeating the silent angler. Again, with all the dice actions, the first thing we're going to do is select a die from the available dice pool, and in this case, we'll use this 3 for our example. Using a dice value 3 would allow us to reel our real board 3 spaces in an attempt to bring in this fish. However, the first thing you've got to do after selecting your die is subtract the drag value of the fish, in this case 2. So effectively, that's going to make our die a 1. So we'll rotate our wheel one space, and then you'll carry out the action of the space you landed on. That's going to be the same whether you went all the way around the board or any number of spaces. The first space allows us to place our drag marker onto the fish that we've got on the line. This is valuable because it covers up their drag value, and further dice used to reel this fish won't cost us any extra pips. Let's talk about what the other possible options for these special actions are. Landing here would allow us to take one of the available momentum tiles from the board. As we talked about during setup, beginning your solo adventure, you've only got one available momentum tile, but it would allow you to bring it from the board into your play area so that you can use its special ability. Simply place the tile near your player area, and while it's in your area before or after you take your dice action, you can use a momentum tile. Each momentum tile is double-sided, however you can only use the ability of the side that is up facing up, and after you use your momentum tile you would flip it and return it to the player board, giving you a different ability that you could attempt to gain later. Note there is a restriction that you can only play one momentum tile per turn, and you can only have one momentum tile in your player area at a time. Our starting momentum tile allows us to either have a free swap of our flag token as long as we don't have a fish on the line, or cast as though we had selected die value 6. This is interesting because it's a bonus action, so you're not using a dice to make that cast action, so this is one of the ways that you can get more fish out of a game than just the three dice that you're going to select each turn. Next up, this space simply gives us plus one finesse. So if we were on two, we would move up to three, and then the last space has you reference the color of your fish. If it's a green fish, you immediately spin us head to the next space, and if it's a yellow, you spin back and resolve that action. If you were to land on or pass your center space, you move your fish one space to the left and keep using real actions until you've done so, moving him completely off your player board, then you will have caught that fish. You'd return your drag token to your board and simply put the fish in your play area to score its points later. That's all three of the dice actions that you could take on your turn, and we've talked about momentum actions and finesse actions, so let's take just a moment to talk about skill card actions, which would be the final type of bonus action. Skill cards are what you can find under rocks that are in your stream. There are a wide variety of skills available, however, let's talk about just a few. Skill cards with the red border and two fish listed will indicate bonus victory points if you were to catch those type of fish in your game. Skill cards with the green border indicate a special ability. Each of these special abilities is referenced in the appendix section of your rulebook, and you can notice this card has an E, so you would simply look up the skill card E to determine what it does. In this case, once per turn, immediately after having completed a cast action, if you didn't catch a fish, gain one finesse. 
This card allows you to treat a three as though it's a four. For this card, if you use a one to take a finesse action, you gain three finesse rather than two, and there are many more abilities that you'll discover as you play along. We've covered setup, the actions you can take, as well as your adventure guide, so now let's put it all together and walk through a sample turn of Fly Solo. We'll also show you how to score each game, as well as take a final look at how you complete challenges, gain badges, and spin those badges to upgrade your fishermen. Each round of the game begins by you referencing the number in the lower right corner of the hatch tile, which is off the game board, to tell you how many dice you're going to roll this turn. In this instance, we'll roll five dice into the pool. Each of these five dice will be used to take dice actions as you walk through your turn. The human player will take the first three dice and perform actions along with any bonus actions they may have, and then the silent angler will take any remaining dice. Let's zoom in a little differently on the board, and we'll walk through three actions just to show you how a sample turn would work. As I said, you'll gain the first three dice to take consecutive actions, leaving the silent angler with whatever's left. So while sometimes you'll want to make sure you take the dice that allow you to get what you want occasionally, you may want to take the dice that leave the silent angler with what you're willing to allow him to try to get. Don't worry, we'll walk through how the silent angler takes his turn as well. But let's just say, as an example, we began by selecting one of these fives. Looking at the 1A player board, it tells us we're going to get four points for each set of dolly, cutthroat, and brook that we catch. Column 5 has two dollies and a brook, so it seems like a reasonable place to start. We also have a green fly, and column 5 has green hatch tiles. So the first thing we'll do is take our casting marker and select which of the fish we'd like to try to catch. Now remember, with each die action, you can either cast, reel, take a finesse action, and then you can use bonus actions within those dice actions. Obviously, we don't begin the game with a fish, and the goal is to catch seven fish, so that's why we're going to start like this. I think I'll begin by placing my casting marker here on this brook, and as we learned when we walked through how the cast action worked, casting into a column with a hatch token that matches my fly color is going to get me a strike card. I also talked earlier about the app that can be used in place of the strike cards, and I'm going to throw that up on the screen here so that you can see how that works. Simply touch the screen and it'll give you a strike card. This, of course, indicates that we didn't catch the fish. So we're going to drift down the stream where we can drift adjacent to the fish we're drifting from. And we'll just keep going here onto this brook. We still have the opportunity to catch a brook. It's still got a match for us, but we're on a drift now. So that's going to give us two strike cards. We'll simply touch our screen here and it'll deal another strike card. And we've caught the fish, so we'll pull our casting marker to the side, take the fish, flip it, and put it in the right spot above our board. And then our fly color was green, so we get to take a green hatch token and place it there. We also caught a fish adjacent to a rock card, so we get to reveal that. And this gives us a special ability for the rest of the game. For two finesse, we can cast as though we had a three. So we'll set that near our game area. We will fill in our two empty spaces. And that concludes our first dice action. Next up, I think we'll choose the six and do a reel action. That'll allow us to reel six spaces. But we've got to reference the drag value of our fish, which is one. So that's going to allow us to move five spaces. We'll count around. One, two, three, four, five. And that puts us back in the center position, which is going to move our fish one space to the left, and we're one rotation of the wheel closer to catching the fish. And then just for the sake of example, we'll go ahead and use one of these twos, and we'll increase our finesse by two so that we've got some finesse points moving forward throughout the game to help us bend the rules and make our gameplay that much more effective. We've selected three dice, so now it's the silent angler's turn to select dice. Simply, the silent angler is going to try to catch fish. They'll use the remaining dice and select them from lowest to highest. So we'll start with this two-valued dice, and we'll just set that over to the side. And that tells us the Silent Angler is going to cast into column two of the game board. They always select the bottom-most space near your hatch tiles. And the Silent Angler always gets one strike card, no matter whether they've drifted or not. So we'll bring back our app, and we'll give it a shuffle and deal out our first strike card. That's a miss, so the Silent Angler will drift up in that same column, 
and obviously no strike cards are gained on rocks, so his second drift action will drift onto this brown and will draw another strike card, and that's a catch. We'll set our casting marker to the side. We'll simply take this brown and set it into a scoring area for the silent angler. He's also going to take one of the hatch tokens on this column and determine which. You'll look at the diagram above the scoring section of the board, and that'll tell you which color he's going to take depending on which column he cast into. In this case, it was a two, so they would select a green. However, that's not available, so you'll simply walk clockwise around the chart, and he'll take this yellow hatch token and place it into his scoring area. Also, because the Silent Angler caught a fish adjacent to a rock card, it's going to cause us to have to discard one of these two rock cards. Now, it may not always be the case that he's adjacent to two of them. However, when it is, you get to choose which one is discarded. So let's go ahead and discard this card. And this is one of the ways the Silent Angler will make it more difficult on you as the solo player. We will refill those two spots on the board. And that concludes his cast. Like I said, the Silent Angler is always going to make a cast action, so we'll use the last dice, which is a five, and that puts our marker out of the bottom space to the five column. We'll reshuffle our strike deck and deal out a card, and that's a miss. We will drift upwards, and another miss, and a final drift onto this dolly, and another miss, so we'll place our marker to the side, and the Silent Angler's failed to catch a fish. Had the Silent Angler not caught a fish in the entire turn, we would have moved the Silent Angler marker forward one space on the game board, and that's going to gain additional points for them at end game scoring. That didn't happen, so we'll move that back. And now we'll move on to round in. The first thing we need to do is move our hatch token. So we'll take the far leftmost tile off and simply slide all the other tiles to the left, placing the one that was off the board into its space and the one that came off the left end to the right of the street. We'll reference the number in the lower right corner of the rightmost hatch tile, and that tells us we're going to roll four dice for the next turn. Play continues in this manner until either you or the Silent Angler has caught a seventh fish. You'll finish out that turn and then move on to scoring. And we'll begin scoring by looking at the top section of the game board, which shows us the common achievements. These achievements can be scored by both you and the Silent Angler. If you'll remember, during setup, we placed the one leftover orange hatch token in the bonus hatch token space on the board, and that's going to allow us to score one point for each orange hatch token we collected. As you can see, we collected three, so that gives us three points. Next, we'll gain three points for each set of yellow, black, and green fish cards that we caught. Taking a look at the fish cards that we caught, we only caught one green, so at a maximum we could put together one set. We do have yellows and blacks. So that's going to give us three more points, bringing our total to six. Next up, we were fortunate enough to be the first player to collect seven fish and trigger the end of the game. So that's going to give us two more points and bring our total up to eight. And lastly, we did manage to catch two coho, and the silent angler only caught one. So we're going to score those six bonus points, bringing us to 14. Next, we'll calculate victory point values on each of our fish cards and add that to our score. So that gives us 28 more points, bringing our total of 42. Then we'll move to the scoring conditions on our own individual player boards. For each orange hatch token, we're going to get another point, so that gives us three more. For each green, we'll get a point, so there's another point. And then we didn't have any yellows, which would have given us a point, but we do have two whites, which are two points apiece, giving us four more points and bringing our total to 50. Next, we'll get two points for each brown that we caught. We did catch two browns, so that's going to give us four more points. Next up, we'll get four points for each set of Dolly, Cutthroat, and Brook that we caught. We did make one set of those, so that'll give us four more points. And then we'll get five points for each different set of four hatch tokens that we collected. So if we take out our differences, we can make one set there, so that's going to give us five more points, bringing our total score to 63. Let's move over and see how the Silent Angler did. The Silent Angler will also score the common achievements and their fish cards, so let's bring that section of the board back up. You'll notice that the Silent Angler has one orange bonus hatch token, so they'll gain one point. And they are able to make two complete sets of green, yellow, and black cards, so that's going to be six points, bringing their total to seven. We got the bonus two points for catching our seventh fish first, so that'll deny those points to the Silent Angler. And they only had one coho. If you'll remember, we had two, which will deny them those six points. 
Next, you'll want to reference the position of the Silent Angler token on his scoring track and note that he gets three points for his position here. Then you'll simply total up the points on fish exactly how you did for yourself, which will give the Silent Angler 24 more points, bringing his total to 34. And finally, you'll again reference your adventure guide and notice the Silent Angler scoring conditions that are at the bottom of the location at which you're fishing. Obviously, we started off at the Crooked Fork, so the Silent Angler is going to get two points for each unique hatch token that they collected. He collected five unique colors, so that's going to give him 10 points, bringing his total to 44. Then he'll score three points for each set of fish he's collected. That'll be two identical fish, and he's only got one collection of two identical fish, so he'll score three more points. And then he'll gain a point for each steelhead and brown that he collected in this game. So he has two browns, giving him two more points and bringing his total to 49. At this point, we can record our scores for day one in our journal, marking 63 for ourselves and 49 for the Silent Angler. We've defeated the Silent Angler at the first location, and we can move on now to the Hunter's Cabin in our next game. And remember, we have to win four games over the course of seven days to defeat the Silent Angler. Now let's take a look at our guidebook challenges and see how we fared trying to unlock some more badges. Don't forget, we did defeat the Silent Angler at the Crooked Fork, so you'll underline the badge next to the title for that location, and that'll give us one badge we can spend on upgrades so far. First up, let's look at the species goals. For these challenges, we simply mark off one box for each of that type of species that we caught. We caught one dolly, so we'll mark off the first box of that line. We caught one cutthroat, and we also caught one brook. Next up, we caught two browns, so we'll mark the first two boxes of that line. And then we have two coho as well, so we'll mark those boxes. For the balanced fishing track, basically you're going to mark a box for each color fish that you caught as it corresponds to that track. So that gives us one green, three black, and three yellow. Next, for the big ones, we'll reference the fish that we caught and see if we caught any of these maximum victory point fish for each one of these types. As you can see, we don't have any of these legendary catches, so we'll move on to the bonus hatch token space A. We collected three orange bonus hatch tokens in this game, so we'll mark the first three boxes of this section. We've made good progress towards unlocking more badges. However, at this time, we've still only got one, so we can move back over to our journal and now make a decision on where we want to spend this badge to upgrade our fishermen. You can choose any available upgrade in this section, but I think I'd like to start each game with a little more finesse moving forward, so I'm going to go ahead and color in the star for the first finesse upgrade. Also, you can keep track of which badges you've spent by coloring in their corresponding star, leaving only the ones that are underlined as unspent. And that's how you set up and play the solo adventure variant of Freshwater Fly from designer Brian Suri and publisher Bellwether Games, who, again, have sponsored this How to Play video. I hope that you've enjoyed this video and that it helps you get set up and playing. If you have any questions or comments, please post them in the comments section below, and I'll do my best to answer them. If this video helped you, please consider hitting the like icon, and don't forget to subscribe for more hobby game related content. For Roll to Hit Gaming, I'm Lucas, and thanks for playing along.